Hello and happy new year, Money Multipliers. Welcome back to another episode of the Money Multiplier Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Kessler, and we ask ourselves, do our dollars make sense? So hello, 2024. Thanks for tuning in. So this is the first episode of the new year. So we have a a lot of cool and exciting content that's going to be coming out here. Um, If y'all didn't hear on my last episode, coming up next weekend, so January 13th, Jonah Dew and myself, we're going to be going live for a virtual webinar event that's going to be happening on a Saturday, the 13th of January. And we're going to go from about like 11 a.m. Eastern time till about 5.30 p.m. And uh, you can register. It's free. We're calling it the Millennial Wealth Building Boot Camp or something along those lines. My, my people are going to be mad at me, but whatever, right? So we're just going to be hopping on. We're going to be sharing the up-to-date knowledge of what's happening in 2024, the infinite banking concept, average rates of return versus actual rates of return, all right? So we got a lot of cool and exciting stuff coming up. So come and join Jonah and myself. You can go to our website, themoneymultiplier.com forward slash January 2024 and that will take you to the event page to register for your spot. So we have a very limited number of spots available so go and snag yours and um, I'll see you on. All right in today's episode We're going to be talking about grocery store prices. All right, I think this is a common topic, especially after like the pandemic. And I know we just had the holiday season. So we were baking, we were purchasing things at the store, cooking our meals for our family in town, or maybe you went somewhere else for the holidays. But what is going on with the grocery store prices? So I have some cool topics and points that I want to help y'all so you can understand what's going on in the economy and really understanding the why. So we're going to talk about that in today's episode. Stay tuned. All right, so I'm going to be listing a few uh, resources down below in the show notes. So you can guys, you guys can go out there and explore kind of where I'm getting some of this research data at. But uh, I saw an article because at the time of this recording, we're not quite into the new year. So all of my information I have is based on 2023 numbers, specifically November of 2023. And What I found is an article that was published on November 22nd by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And they were kind of talking about in 2024, what is going to be the differences or the food prices increasing into this next year. So I kind of want to give some stats to my analytical folks. So they're stating that in 2024, all food prices are predicted to increase by 2.9%. So the food at home prices are predicted to increase by 1.6%. And the food away from home prices are predicted to increase to 4.3%. So they kind of had a summary in the article talking about, you know, food prices rose in 2023. However, it was at a slower pace than what they did in 2022. So this is according to the USDA. And overall, okay, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, overall, they're telling that us that the food price increase is reported to be a 3.1% over the course of 2023. So I kind of just gave you what was happening prior to 24 and then moving forward 2024 and on, it's, it's predicted to increase by 2.9%. Actually, I want to tell some of my restaurant uh, owners this uh, stat because they are saying that restaurant patrons are still paying more, about 5.3% more for food than what they did over a year ago. And there's some reasons of why this is happening. Um, You know, one of the biggest causes is that, you know, obviously inflation, right? If you've been following me for some time, you understand that inflation plays some 
some part into this, but specifically the groceries, you know, after the pandemic, there was a supply chain disruption and there were tariffs on certain foreign imports that were coming in. You know, that plus our labor costs and the war in Ukraine. Get this, I actually found this out. Ukraine's food experts have historically accounted for 9% of the global wheat market and 12% of the corn market. And this is according to the USDA's Foreign Agriculture Agricultural Service. There we go. I, I thought that was really interesting. I didn't understand how, you know, the agriculture out there in Ukraine and kind of their food supply and how they are distributing out to the whole world and globally. So wheat and corn is, I guess, what we are getting from Ukraine, along with some other things like oil, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the episode. But specifically to groceries, this is why we are seeing the price of food start to increase increase. So here's the overall gist. Grocery store prices are still rising, but it's a lot slower than what we saw in 2022. So the U.S. government said that prices for consumers inched higher in November of 23 compared to a year ago, November 2022. But the pace of inflation continued to slow from last year. Okay, the pace of inflation is slowing, but that doesn't mean it's stopping. All right, you know, easing inflation doesn't actually mean that prices are falling. It just means that these prices are growing, but they're rising a lot more slowly than what we saw in 2022. So here, I'm gonna post up a little chart that I found. And uh, this, I, I believe I found it on CNBC when they were talking about the food prices in November of 23. But here's just kind of a chart here that's showing us, all right, here is how the price increase is happening over the month. You know, you have your different sections there of the food at home. Hey, what's really interesting, I didn't find anything about this, but juices and drinks, they're over 18% more right now. I thought that was really interesting. So I was kind of going in and I was trying to find some data on this and I just didn't find anything. I was curious of maybe Maybe because we're in the winter months, you know, the juices and the drinks that these corporations or, or organizations are creating, you know, maybe that's why because of the time of year that we're in right now. But I found that very interesting. Um, but you can kind of see how these prices are increasing. And this is just a breakdown for November 2023. And it's the year over year price changes. Now look at this one. This is the consumer price index. Um, and it shows us the historical data from 1983 to 2023. And this has changed over time for food, food at home and food away from home and how the prices are changing as we evolve through life and throughout the years. And so you can see, I mean, prices are gonna keep going up and up and up. And actually you can kind of see right there in 2022, you really see, 2021, 22 is when they really jumped up. And I think kind of the reason why they jumped up is because the pandemic was happening and people were rushing to the grocery stores just trying to stock up on food, um, beverages, food, uh, clothing items, cleaning supplies, water, you know, things like that, because we didn't know what was going on during the pandemic at the time, okay? And so a lot of people were just rushing to the stores and they were just paying astronomical prices because it was the supply and demand, right? That's just how it operates. If the demand is there and it's high and the supply is low, your prices are going to be a lot higher. So I think grocery stores kind of 
of took advantage of that and they could they could upcharge and upsell what they were pricing their products at because they had the supply or excuse me the demand to do so and people were spending the money it was that plus you know during the time where everybody was getting out their stimulus checks from the government um, people had the resources to go and buy these items and bring them home to their families so grocery stores kind of took advantage of that time because they could go out there and price whatever they wanted to on the shelves and people would still pay for it because they didn't want to go home empty-handed with no water wondering hey will I ever be able to go and buy this package of water bottles from Walmart any longer nobody really knew and there was kind of a scarcity that was happening in the world so I think now because things are getting back to normal and for my audio listeners, I just put little air quotes up there. But I think because things are kind of getting back to the normal way, you know, there is a decline in the progression of how inflation is treating our economy. Um, I, I thought this was very interesting. I thought the community would have like a little giggle about this. But there's actually a, a little article that I found and it says... The U.S. Federal Reserve aims for a 2% annual inflation rate over the long term. And there is this individual, their name is Zandi. Zandi said, I expect by this time next year, we'll be back within spitting distance of the target. Y'all, what is the target? All right, can you inform us, the public over here, what is the target and what are we aiming for? Because in my opinion, if our dollar was still tied back to the gold standard, I think we would have a target and within the free market that the people can go and do their business with. You know, now because there is just a printing press in the backyard of the Federal Reserve System, you know, they can do literally whatever they want want. All right. And I think, oh my gosh, just go back to my other episodes where my friend John and I, we were going through the book, The Creature of Jekyll Island, and we're talking all about the creation of the Federal Reserve System. You know, so all of these people, they're saying, hey, we aim for a 2% annual inflation rate over the long term. Y'all, how can we just prevent us from not even having inflation? All right, I understand that the prices of goods, commodities, whatever, they're going to keep going up and up because our dollar, again, is not tied to anything. It's just fiat money currency. But you know, why do we have to track this thing where, hey, yep, it's going to keep going up and there's nothing that we can do about it. Yeah, there's something that you could have done about it. You could have done it back in the 70s and 80s when Nixon took off the gold standard and took the dollar away and untied it to the gold. Now there's just nothing to tie it to. So that purchasing power of that dollar is just going to become weaker and weaker and weaker. And we see this. Oh my gosh. So for my older folks, I've never personally lived this because as you guys know I'm only in my 20s and so back then right where price of gas was like some odd cents a gallon oh my gosh now we're up to the point where at one time my California folks remember when you guys were paying like eight seven bucks for a gallon of gas down here in Florida it's like 320 okay so we're still paying out for this pricing of these commodities or purchases or resources that we have here and I think there's definitely a way that we can slow this or not even have this happening but nobody wants to change that because everybody wants to get paid a nice paycheck to their pocket Mr. Government oopsies I might get uh, my show canceled here but oh well that's why I live in America I enjoy the freedom of speech hey let's talk about this the supply and demand this was an article CNBC, it was dated December 12th, 2023. Um, and again, I'm going to link the articles down below in the show notes. So they're saying at a high level, inflationary pressure are also due to an imbalance between supply and demand. For example, energy prices spiked in early 2022 after Russia invaded Ukraine. 
fears of a supply disruption in energy commodities such as oil. So like I mentioned, you know, prices at the pump as of November 2023 are expected to continue to decline, uh, honestly, like shaving off about five or seven cents in the next weeks of where we were at in in November of 23. But uh, Lippo, okay, Lippo was saying that, hey, we've seen oil prices slide over the last week and they're taking gasoline and diesel down with it. So across the board, energy is getting cheaper for the consumer. So we're going to have those windfalls and downfalls and the slopes and rises as it comes to our financials. And it really just depends on what's going on in the economy at the time, you know, political things or environmental changes. I don't know, anything could really mess with that market of what's happening. And so they continue on to say that supply chains were snarled when the U.S. economy restarted during the COVID-19 pandemic, driving up the prices for goods. Meanwhile, the demand was strong as consumers because they flush with cash from government stimulus and stay in home for the year. Wages grew at their fastest pace in decades, pushing up the business labor costs. And just in my humble opinion, I think the reason for it is, yeah, you know, the price of things is going up. So we got to be paying our employees and our people that fair salary and wage to make sure that they have a roof over their head and be able to put food on the table. But also... I think because the government made it easy for people to make just as much money sitting at home collecting those unemployment checks rather than going out there and flipping burgers at McDonald's. So I think that's one of the reasons why even labor prices are going up because the government's kind of making it easy for people to just want to stay home. Well, hey, I can just sit my ass out out on the couch over there, uh, watch my favorite TV shows all day, collecting my checks rather than getting up at 6 a.m. and going to a job, right? And so people were taking advantage of that. And I don't know, you can't hate the player, you just got to hate the game. So that's kind of some of the reasons of why these labor costs are also going up. And that is why we are seeing that when we're going out to the grocery stores, purchasing our eggs, our bagels, our bread, our milk, okay, whatever it is that we're buying for our families just to feed ourselves. That's why we're seeing these prices still increase as time goes on. So you're probably thinking to yourself, well, Hannah, all right, you're giving me all these facts and this data, and yeah, it's probably not something new to you, but why does it matter? Why should it matter to you? Well, why does it matter? Because prices are going to keep going up. Nothing is going to stop it. We have been in this ever going cycle of prices always increasing because like I mentioned, our dollar is just not tied to anything anymore. And I do believe that inflation is slowing in growth, but, and I think it's because we're past that time of the pandemic and the Fed isn't out there being printing happy in their backyard anymore, but you need to understand that your dollar is going to keep losing value as time goes on and it's going to keep losing that purchasing power of it. So how can we help ourselves and control what we can control? And this is another reason of why the infinite banking concept is so important to average day Americans like you and myself. I mean, we cannot control what the government's going to do. You know, what political uproar is going to happen, what folks and your neighbors are saying out there on the streets. You know, we cannot control everything. We can only focus on what we can control. And honestly, for my folks who've got anxiety, that should help you a lot. And that should really be setting off some bells in your head. All right, because you cannot control what others are going to think, say, and do. You can only control what's in your realm of what you can take and, and control. So, 
This is why I talk all the time about opportunity cost and this concept, right? You know, if I am just going out there and I'm busting my butt and I'm going out and I'm making my money and I'm going and I'm putting it down at the local bank where I'm making pennies on that money, you know, you are not hedging yourself against this inflation. And reminder, inflation, all it is, it's just a hidden tax. It's just a hidden tax, okay? Because inflation at the end of the day, it's put back on us, the American taxpayers. So this inflation that we're seeing, it's because of the neglect, the immunity that the Federal Reserve System is doing to us. And we got to start just harnessing the power that we have with these tools that are made available to us, right? When I talk about the infinite banking concept, I never start my discussion saying that, hey, it's whole life insurance. Because once you start to say the word insurance, especially whole life, you're losing people. People's minds are getting cut off there. All right. And for my video viewers, say hi to Daisy. Daisy apparently is in the studio today and wants to say hi to everybody. We love her. Mm. All right. But anyways, <laughs> Quick little uh, commercial break. So, you know, that that's why when I'm going out and I'm talking about this concept, I never start the discussion saying that, hey, this is life insurance. Because when people think about life insurance, they're always thinking about death benefit. And I'm going to use this when I die, when I graduate. And I mean, that's kind of one of the questions that people will ask me a lot too is, once somebody has really understood the banking business in their life, their next question that they ask me is they say, well, Hannah, why isn't everybody doing this? And I, my response back to you is I agree. I ask myself that same question every single day. And I think the reason that, that not everybody is going out there and seeking the knowledge or the information or kind of putting up that roadblock with them is because when they think about whole life insurance, they think it's just for death benefit after I am no longer here. And we are just not taught or informed about the power of how to utilize a structured a properly structured, overfunded whole life policy. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why not everybody is doing this. And I think another reason, too, is, is that everybody's got different money philosophies. I mean, you could totally be disagreeing with me right now, and that's totally fine. That is why we live in this country of America, to have that freedom to be able to think for ourselves and ask our own questions and have our own opinion. So... You know, with this concept though, all right, Hannah, well, I'm hearing you talk about grocery prices increasing, you know, inflation as time goes on. So I understand that maybe I should be using this policy to be able to store this wealth in so that now once that money gets inside the policy, I'm always and forever earning the uninterrupted compounding and dividends inside of the policy. But you know, hey, is it a smart idea? Should I maybe go out and start using my policy to go buy my groceries? Okay, and and what and my feedback to y'all is is that you know you could I guess you could use the cash value in your policy to go buy your groceries. I mean, is it my favorite thing to do with the policy? I mean, probably not. Not until we get into those later stages of the policy's life. Because later on down the road, I mean, you could definitely use the policy to supplement your income during those retirement stages of your life, those passive years of your life. And you can actually draw tax-free income from the policies and use that to go and pay the grocery bill, pay the light bill, the gasoline for the car, whatever. So, you know, is it a good idea though, like right off the bat, and it kind of falls into that category of, okay, Hannah, you know, you're telling me that when I go and I produce this money, you know, this money has to flow through somebody's bank. And instead of leaving it down at the commercial banks, is it a good idea that I should flow all of my income through my policy and then just take from my policy to go and pay for my monthly expenses? And 
Again, you could, right? Because you can use the cash value in the policy for literally anything. The prime example I always use is, hey, go buy a pack of chewing gum down at the convenience store with your policy money if you really wanted to. Um, I do have a few folks though who are very cash flow positive, all right? They got a lot of money that's coming in every month, every year, and they have a, a need to just warehouse it somewhere. And you know, I do have some of my people who will start their policy and then immediately turn around and use their policy cash because their premium is equaling their income. And then they're going in there and using the cash values from the policy to go and pay for the monthly expenses. And then they're just making sure that at the end of the year if they are not paying back those policy loans just make sure that you at least at least at least pay that loan interest annually on the policy um but is everybody doing that no are the majority of my folks doing that no okay so because if i use this analogy like let's say that i have somebody who is producing a million dollars a year all right they're producing a million dollars a year and when they put that first initial premium inside the policy you are not going to have access to that dollar for dollar quite yet right i tell you 60 percent year one we have access to 60 percent of our premium deposit so if that individual is making a million a year well year one they're only going to have access to six hundred thousand dollars of cash value loans that they can take out from their policy and start using and sometimes it just may not be feasible to take a 40 percent hit in our income this first year just by starting the policy so can you use the policy to go buy the groceries sure you could but what I think is a better way to cover these monthly expenses is take the cash values from the policy and go buy yourself cash flowing assets so with the policy money, you can go and take this out to go place it into these cash flowing assets. And I think it's a great idea because now the money is out there working in the investment that you have it placed in and it's still working. It never left your policy. It's always in there growing uninterrupted compounding. And then each month when you are getting paid back the interest or principal and interest of that investment that you're making, use that to cover now the grocery bill and the monthly expenses. So you know, there has been like a month or two. I remember like last summer, I was out on the road and I was living in the van for a little bit and I kind of racked up a higher than normal credit card bill. All right, so I was going out. I think it was like my best girlfriend's birthday or something. So we we're kind of going ham on the credit card and I, I had to go and pay off the credit card bill for the month because I don't want to be charged that interest. And so what I had to do was I went into one of my policies and I took out a loan to go and pay for the credit card bill. And then all I did that next month is I just paid myself back and paid those loan repayments back to the policy, just replenishing the capital inside of there. You know, so you could totally do that. I mean, put your livelihood on a credit card and then at the end of the month, pay off the credit card with the policy money, then just save back up, putting the money back inside the policy because remember right I always say this too the policy the correlation it's nothing more than just that glorified savings vehicle so anytime that you go and you pay back the loans or put money back inside the policy well now it's just showing up as cash available again so don't be afraid to pay back your loans, okay? I talk about that a lot. Play honest banker with yourself. If you can't, if you can't pay back your loans for one month, totally fine. You are your own banker now. You're not gonna get penalized or foreclosed on or get your car towed or something like that. Get your gold or silver confiscated. So that does not happen because at the end of the day, 
A loan is nothing more than a prepayment of the death benefit. And that's how the insurance company knows that, hey, we're going to get made whole again in the end anyways. You are guaranteed to graduate or die. Everybody's got an expiration date. So at the time of your passing, any outstanding loans would just get subtracted from your death benefit. Hey, actually, something else I was just thinking of right now, too. You know, let's just clarify this. So for some of my new listeners, why? Hannah, well, why would I use the policy? Yeah, I understand that I could put my money in there. It's growing at a larger guaranteed interest rate than what I'm getting at the local bank. You know, yeah, I understand that it's tax-free growth. Um, yeah, Hannah, I understand that the policy is a protected asset, but you know, how, how is that money still growing inside the policy, even though I'm dipping in there and I'm taking out this cash value to go buy my purchases? Well, here's what's happening. When you call the insurance company and you are taking out a loan from the policy, we're not withdrawing it. You could, I mean, you can take out tax-free withdrawals from the policy and later on down the road during retirement years, you may switch instead of taking out loans, you're taking out withdrawals from the policy, but we're not taking out withdrawals. So we're not physically withdrawing the cash out of the policy. So what we're essentially saying is, hey, policy or hey, insurance company, So I am going to put my policy up for collateral. I'm going to put my cash value, my death benefit up for collateral, and I'm going to take a loan from your general funds. So in the real world, we are using the insurance company's money, which then allows our money to sit in the policy to grow and compound as if it was never even touched. So that's how and why the uninterrupted compounding is happening because we're not borrowing out our actual money. Here's an example for my real estate investors. HELOC loans, home equity lines of credit. You know, if you are going to go out there and put your house up for collateral and pull out the equity from your property... That's the same thing as putting your death benefit on your life insurance policy up for collateral and you're pulling out the cash and the equity from the policy. It's just the big two major differences between the HELOC loan and the policy loan is is that at the HELOC loan, the bank's in control. You got to make sure that you're paying that banker at least the interest that is being charged on that HELOC HELOC loan each and every month where in the policy world is that principal of the loan have to get paid back no let alone does the interest even have to get paid back no but I'm gonna coach you that you should pay yourself back pay yourself back with interest and at least make that loan interest annually on the policy But is it really required though? No, because if you don't pay it, all the insurance company is going to do is just deduct it from future cash values anyways. So just at least pay your loan interest on the policies and then just keep using your loan money. So y'all, I actually have some tips I want to give you when you're going out and you're grocery shopping for yourself. All right, if you don't do this already, check what you have already and make a list Okay, don't just go flying blind when you're going into the grocery store and thinking, hey, do I have butter? Do I have oil? I don't know. I didn't check before I left. You should be checking. Check and make a list. All right. It kind of reminds me of like the Christmas time. Check yourself twice and make a list or something like that. (laughs) But but okay. so when you're going to the grocery store, check what you already have and make a list. And when you make a list, 
stick to the list. Okay, don't be going out there and seeing some gingerbread houses or new shoes that you see hanging on the wall at Walmart or wherever you're shopping at. Okay, don't go out there and just be spending this money because, oh, I have the money. I can go and spend it. Look, my credit card swipes. I can buy it. No, make your list and stick to the list. This is like budgeting 101, but sometimes it's hard for people to do that. Sometimes you folks have some shopping addictions and you just think that, hey, this is nice and shiny and I want it in my bedroom, my bathroom, my kitchen, I'm going to go and buy it. No, you know, delay those gratifications for yourself. I would rather have my investments pay for my nice shiny objects rather than me coming out of pocket with my hard earned working money. So next time you go to the grocery store, I want you to make a list and I want you to stick to it. And when you go and you're looking at these prices, Pay attention to the prices, okay? You know, it's okay to try out some of those generic labels. All right, I, I do agree that the ingredients are important. You should be looking at your labels and just don't be afraid to try the non-premium brands, all right? It's okay, instead of going out and buying Tide, maybe you go and buy Gains, okay? So so it's okay to go and try these different alternative brands. You know, definitely check your ingredients, make sure it's healthy and, and for you and what your dietary needs are. But I, and actually, y'all, let me tell you this. There's one thing my father and I don't go cheap on, and it's cheese. I do not go cheap on cheese, and I will keep buying that premium cheese. But everything else, I mean, I'm totally okay to get the Kirkland Costco, the Kirkland brand stuff, or um, even the, oh, what's Walmart's? Walmart's is... It's not best choice. Why am I blanking on it right now? I'm going to remember it after I get done with this recording, but it's the... It's not best choice. It's the, oh, great value. Is it great value? Now I'm kind of second guessing myself, but it's okay to try the, the generic label brands. And I encourage you to try some of the stuff. And then once you try it and you don't like it, perfect. Now you know that you don't like it, go back to the old way. But sometimes some of y'all will look Okay, thanks, Daisy. <laughs> but some of y'all will try these new products and you're like, holy crap, I kind of like this a little bit better than the premium brand I have been purchasing for myself. So go out and test some things out. It's okay to try the generic labels because most of the time those generic labels are a lot cheaper because you're not paying the name brand prices for it. And Here's something else that I would do too. You know, when you see some sales around there, oh, also, don't be afraid to use coupons. Oh my gosh, my father, he, he will get coupons in the mail and he's like, Hannah, I know we said we we're gonna go to that Mediterranean restaurant today, but look right here, I got a two for one at Arby's. Can we go to Arby's today? <laughs> so, you know, coupons are great. Use those coupons. Actually, down here in Florida, I get in the mail. I don't know if I like signed up for this or something, but I have have these value packs that come into my mailbox every single week. I love those things. I go through them every week and I look to see what kind of coupons are on there. And sometimes if I find a deal for a restaurant in town or maybe at another grocery store, I'll go use it. So don't be afraid to use coupons and kind of stock up on those sales. All right. Now be courteous to the stocking up that you're doing. All right. So like Let's say that there's a sale on paper towels right now. Okay, paper towels don't expire. I can go and stock up on some paper towels and utilize this deal that they are doing, but let's say that there is a deal on chopped salad kits. Well, no, I'm not gonna go out there and purchase my stock, my chopped salad kits and stock up on it because there's an expiration date for how long that food is good for. So just be mindful of those sales that are going on and just make sure that, hey, if I'm gonna be stocking up on some stuff, make sure it makes financial sense and that there's no expiration date on that product that you're purchasing. So, I hope this episode was helpful, kind of a little insightful to what's going on right now in the grocery store prices world. And um, we're gonna see some changes. I mean, that's just life. Everything is always growing and 
evolving as time goes on and I want to be here to keep bringing y'all the up-to-date info of what's happening in the economy. Now, here's just my conclusion, okay? Because yes, th this is what I do. I I'm 100% the infinite banking concept and this is all that I teach, right? You know, here's my feedback. Just to summarize what I've been talking about here the last 30 minutes or so. If we are going to be using the policy to go and buy our groceries. Fine, you can do it because you can use the cash value in the policy for anything. I personally do not do that. If I am in a emergency funds type of mode and okay, Hannah, you need to go pull from your policy to go and pay that credit card bill because you were a little happy swiping this past month then I'll do it. But am I doing it all the time? No, because what I'm doing is I'm using the cash values in the policies to go and buy myself my cash flowing investments that I do. Actually coming up here soon, you know, cause I always tell you guys, I'm never gonna tell you how to make the money, how to go invest the money. If you wanna have the buddy buddy conversations, we can, but what I like to do is private lending. That's just what I'm into in my investments world. Actually, somebody asked me the other day, and sorry, my ADD is kind of going off. Just follow my brain real quick. That Somebody asked me, they said, Hannah, you know, you do a lot of private lending. Why not go out there and purchase the property? You know, you can get the uh, depreciating asset. Oh, shit, not depreciating asset. Hold on, cut that out. It's real estate, hold on. Depreciation, that's what it is. You know, Hannah, why are you not going out there and actually purchasing the real estate itself and actually buying the lands, the building, the mobile home, the residential home, the commercial space? Well, the reason I haven't done it this up to this point is just because I haven't been in real estate investing for that long. I mean, this marks my third year that I've been going out and investing my money into real estate, and it's all been on the paper side, whether it's mortgage notes that I'm buying or doing my private lending, just because... I'm busy, you know, I'm in my building phases of life right now. I'm focusing on my business, the money multiplier, and I'm too busy to be going out there looking at properties or dealing uh, or like tending to tenants and the toilets and the termites. Okay, so it's just not me. I'm not into that right now because somebody kind of challenged me and they're like, well, Hannah, if you go out there and you buy the real estate itself, you can use that depreciation on the asset and I agree but there's other things that I'm doing in my own personal life of how I'm minimizing my tax liabilities and I just don't need it and I don't need the headache and all of the time that to go out and look at these physical properties and actually own that building the house whatever it is so I think it's a great idea I mean if that's what you're into and you like to do that stuff all the power to you. This is the freedom that we have being our own bankers and living here in America. You know, you have the power to do whatever you set your mind to. And to be honest with y'all, I am just not that type of girly where I'm a DIY carpentry type of girl, all right? I will call up my people. I got Rick on speed dial. Rick is my man. He comes over and he'll fix anything that, that I tell him I need help with, all right? Oh my gosh, and they're like the best people ever. If you find that person, it, it's the person that's retired that they like to do things with their hands, very good with mechanical work, plumbing, whatever, and it's... If you find that person, they will be available all the time. They will come out whenever you need them and they're just so knowledgeable and will coach you and show you, hey Hannah, this is what I'm doing and how I'm fixing this stuff. So shout out to Rick. You are awesome, my man. So go and find your people. Go and find your who's in your life. But um, to summarize up, you, you know, no, I'm personally not using direct from policy to grocery store bill. What I do is I put my lightly on my credit card. I have the policy money out there working for me in my investments. Then monthly, when my investments are getting paid out to me, I'm using that 
to pay off that credit card bill. And I just rinse and repeat that cycle every single month. So if you have questions, you want to chat about this stuff, I mean, please holler at me. My email is Hannah, Hannah spelled the same ways forwards and backwards, Hannah at themoneymultiplier.com. And uh, ask me your questions. I'm here. If I maybe don't know the answer to it, I got a team of folks who do know the answer. Very bright and smart people. So stay tuned with some upcoming episodes because actually Pops and I are going to be doing a recording on how we are investing our money with the policy. And I told you on this episode that we do a lot of private lending. And so I kind of want dad to sit down with us in the community and go through, hey, this is where and how I'm investing my cash values from the policy. So that's going to be a real good episode. Some of you guys have seen it live because I know dad was out in 2023. He was at the private money club show that uh, Chris Noggle put on out in Vegas and he did a live presentation on that and you guys loved it. So I kind of want to come and bring that to you so that we can just keep learning more together. That's all it is. We're just building the community. We're all on the same wealth train together and I hope you got some value out of this episode. So as always, give us a five stars, comment down below, ask me your questions, subscribe, follow me on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook. I'm on all platforms. My first name, Hannah. Hannah spelled the same ways forwards and backwards. Kessler with one S. And until next week, I'll see you then. Bye, everybody. Bye.